All right, so first question is the first case, um, the weekend warrior with the acute Achilles tendon rupture. Um, basically five different options, non-op, six weeks of immobilization and then progressive uh, therapy from there, non-op with two weeks of immobilization followed by early weight bearing and range of motion, open end-to-end -end repair, percutaneous or MIS repair, Achilles reconstruction. All right, cool. So we're a little all over the place, which is good. And we have three people who would do uh, non-op with six weeks of immobilization. We have three non-op with two weeks of immobilization. We have three for MIS repair. We have an Achilles reconstruction. Good. So we'll go to the next. Case here. So considering those, what factor most impact impacted your choice of treatment? Good, again, kind of all over the place. We have three for re-rupture rate. We have two for wound complications. We have two for restoration of functional strength. We have two for early return to work or play. And then one other. And if someone wants to say they're other, they, they're more than welcome to. If not, we'll just wait with bated breath. Right. That's me. That's me, Doctor Silver. I'm. I'm just as Swan. Uh, just the the summary of the data supports what I was trying to enter, which was non-operative early range of motion. Gotcha. Um, case two: twenty-year-old female college gymnast with acute Achilles tendon rupture. Same options. Omar asked how big was the gap? We do not have imaging in this patient, so. Good, so everyone's, um, oops. So everyone so far is fixing this. Um, we're about evenly split in terms of open end-to-end -end repair versus uh, MIS. What factor most impacted your treatment choice? Okay, so we have about four for re-rupture rate. We have uh, one for restoration of functional strength and then uh, the most five uh, early return to work or play in this case. And then last case, 55 year old truck driver, three weeks old when he shows up to your office, comes with an MRI that shows a five centimeter gap. 
Good. Okay. We're a little split here. Um, two would non op it with six weeks of mobilization, four non op uh, with two weeks of mobilization, one open end to end repair, and then a couple Achilles tendon reconstructions. So uh, a good spread there. And last question What factor most impacted your treatment choice? Okay, so a lot of answers for wound complications, one for restoration of functional strength, and then a couple for lack of healing potential. Good, so these three cases, a wide variety of options. Um, uh, people are, are mostly split, um, and we'll kind of revisit these at the end and see if anyone will change their mind or if their factors are, are different. So thanks for participating in that. All right, so we'll get back into the meat of the talk. We'll briefly start with some background on Achilles tendon ruptures. Um, so as we all probably know, the Achilles tendon is the largest in the body. It's formed by the confluence of the soleus and the gastroc muscle tendons. Its blood supply comes from the posterior tibial artery and rupture generally occurs about four to six centimeters above the calc insertion in the hypovascular region. Um, incidence is often quoted at 18 and 100,000 per year, although there, there is a range there, um, but the incidence does seem to be increasing. Uh, it's theorized that the aging population is increasingly involved in athletics, um, and Achilles tendon ruptures are up to five times more common in men, and some of the thought is that there are larger muscle mass and greater contractile force in men are like, more likely to exceed the ultimate strength of the tendon. Uh, risk factors for rupture are older athletes, the quote unquote weekend warriors who injure themselves in the third to fifth decade of life. Uh, and other risk factors include steroid injections, fluoroquinolone use, inflammatory arthritis, and unfortunately for myself, the family history. Um, so the mechanism most commonly is um, indirect trauma, a sudden forced plantar flexion or sudden dorsiflexion in a plantar flexed foot. Um, it can also occur with direct trauma, and there is some correlation with longstanding tendinopathy or degeneration. So the diagnosis uh, of acute, acute Achilles tendon rupture remains a, a largely clinical diagnosis. It can be missed in up to a quarter of patients, um, which may lead to chronic cases that impact management and increase morbidity. Uh, other clinical signs and symptoms include weakness and difficulty walking, heel pain, increased resting dorsiflexion, palpable gap, weakness to an ankle plantar flexion. Um, the Thompson test is a provocative test and its nomenclature can be confusing. Uh, the test is performed in the prone position. Um, and interestingly, a positive test is the lack of plantar flexion when squeezing the calf. This is consistent with an Achilles tendon rupture and a negative test is when there's plantar flexion when the calf is squeezed. Uh, possible imaging modalities include x-rays, ultrasound, and MRI. X-rays are often utilized to rule out other pathology, including fractures, bony avulsions, or other bony injuries. Ultrasound and MRI are other adjuncts that may have some clinical value in equivocal cases, partial ruptures, or chronic cases. Here's just a video of demonstrating the Thompson test, showing a positive Thompson test on the left and a negative after repair in the operating room. Uh, this is just a review study published in Injury in 2017 that looked at imaging modalities in the diagnosis and management of Achilles tendon ruptures. Ultrasound and MRI showed good sensitivity and specificity, but their routine use often did not add any additional clinical information. Um, similarly, when used for monitoring Achilles tendon ruptures, there was a wide variety of results that did not often correlate to the clinic, clinical picture. Um, so the authors uh, concluded that while imaging modalities may be useful in ruling out other injuries and as an adjunct in equivocal cases, uh, the diagnosis and monitoring of Achilles tendon ruptures remains a clinical one. 
Now, moving into the treatment options for these injuries, um, non-operative management of these injuries is increasing, and we'll kind of discuss why. Um, historic treatment of these injuries included prolonged immobilization of offered, often greater than six weeks, up to 12 weeks in plantar flexion. Um, more recent treatment has been aimed at accelerated functional rehab focused on early weight bearing and range of motion. Uh, operative treatment options have also been changing. Uh, the use of percutaneous repair or minimally invasive surgery has been increasing and utilizes smaller incisions com compared to the classic vertical open incision. Types of repairs are also a consideration, including end-to-end -end repair and the use of suture anchors and the calcaneus to reinforce repairs. Reconstruction is somewhat outside the scope of this talk, but is often utilized in chronic cases. It can be a powerful tool. So complication considerations, perhaps the biggest um, Consideration for treatment decisions revolves around the complication profiles of the different management options. Historically, the re-rupture rate of non-operative management was considerably high from 10 all the way up to 40% in some studies. Uh, these numbers are largely based upon prolonged periods of mobilization. Uh, more recently, however, the use of accelerated functional rehab that promotes early weight bearing and plantar flexion with early range of motion has shown comparable rates of re-rupture compared to operative management. This comparable re-rupture rate, coupled with the lower overall complication profile compared to operative management, has made conservative management appealing. However, there is a concern for reduced plantar flexion strength and a longer return to work or support with non-op management. As you might imagine, operative management is often associated with higher complications. Concern for wound complications with open surgical management has been as high as 10%. Other surgical complications include sural nerve injuries, which may be higher in percutaneous surgery, but are almost always transient. So this is just briefly about tending healing. Um, understanding the factors that impact tendon healing is important. Uh, many studies have shown in other parts of the body that there is a benefit to functional stimulus on healing tendons. Uh, this paradigm supports the use of early range of motion and weight bearing and functional rehab. Uh, other components to consider are the role of the peritinon and its rich blood supply and source of progenitor cells. And the stages of tendon healing are also important and involve a predictable pattern of hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. So this is an animal study uh, published in um, knee surgery, sports traumatology, and arthroscopy in 2000. It studied a sheep model. Um, Achilles tendons were transected and 1.5 centimeters were partially resected in the middle of the tendon. The resected tendons were compared to control tendons from the contralateral side. Uh, six specimens were analyzed at three, six, and 12 months, and all resected tendons healed spontaneously. Uh, at three months, there was a fibrous tissue with loose fiber orientation and a maximal cross-sectional area. And then by 12 months, there was improved fiber orientation and a near normal histological structure. Um, the rupture forced, uh, the re force required for rupture did increase over time. This is another, another study. It was by Muller et al. in AJSM in uh, 2018 that looked at the role of the peritinon and Achilles healing in a rat study. So there were 60 specimens divided into two groups, uh, resected peritinon and an intact peritinon. A four millimeter uh, portion of the Achilles was resected and the specimens were examined biomechanically and histologically at one, two and four weeks after surgery. Uh, the results of this study show that there was a faster recovery of mechanical strength, increased tear resistance, cross-sectional area, tendon stiffness, and faster collagen formation in the intact peritinon group. These two studies reinforce the importance of the peritinon and the predictable nature of tendon healing in these injuries. So now we've gone through the background uh, of Achilles tendon ruptures and the basic principles of management. We'll take a look at some of the more recent papers comparing operative and non-operative management. So this study was a randomized control trial published in JBJS in 2010, um, perhaps the biggest landmark study that moved the needle on non-operative management with functional rehab. This is a randomized control trial at two Canadian centers with 144 patients split between open end-to-end -end repair and functional rehab. Uh, the primary outcome was re-rupture rate, defined as a positive Thompson test, presence of a palpable gap, and a loss of plantar flexion strength. There were two patients in the operative and three patients in the non-operative group that re-ruptured for a rate of 2.7 in the operative and 4.1% in the non-op groups. There were significantly more total complications in the operative group at 18% compared to the non-operative group at 6%. Otherwise, there was no significant difference between the groups in strength, range of motion, calf circumference, or the Lepilotti score, which is a patient-reported outcome measure. 
The operative group, as I mentioned, was treated with an open vertical incision, end-to-end -end surgical repair using a crack-out type stitch. Uh, they were splinted post-operatively with a foot and 20 degrees of planar flexion. And then at two weeks, the splint and sutures were removed and the accelerated functional rehab program was began. Was began. Um, that same functional rehab program was used in the non-operative group and was treated almost identically. A splint was applied initially in plantar flexion for the first two weeks. Protected weight bearing and range of motion were then initiated um, at that two-week mark. At four weeks, patients were made weight bearing as tolerated and increased their range of motion exercises. Um, this general rehab protocol has been used widely, um, although there are subtle nuances when looking at functional rehab in the literature um, that are important when you're reviewing the literature. This is the flow diagram of the study um, showing the randomization and the number of patients with data at one and two years. So table one shows the eligibility criteria for the study, which is extremely important uh, to consider when analyzing these studies. Uh, they include a complete Achilles rupture that presents within 14 days of injury. Uh, this time to presentation varies across different studies and is a big contributor to the generalizability of the results to patients that may present in a delayed fashion. They took basically all ages from 18 to 70 that were able to comply with the rehab program. Exclusion criteria are also shown and include other injuries, diabetes, avulsion fractures, fluoroquinolone use, amongst others. Table two shows the similar demographics across the two groups. So the left panel um, shows the results of isokinetic data using a dynamometer setup, uh, similar to the picture on the bottom right. Um, there was no difference in plantar flexion strength between the groups except at 240 degrees per second at one and two years in favor of the operative group. Um, unclear of that clinical significance, but it was statistically uh, significant. Um, what is notable is that neither plantar flexion or dorsiflexion strength ever equaled the contralateral side. Um, but they did have at least 80% compared to the unaffected side at all time points. There was no difference in dorsiflexion strength between the two groups at any time point or test velocity. Uh, the table at the top right uh, is an important one and summarizes the complications of both groups. Uh, there was an 18% complication rate in the operative group and an 8% rate in the non-operative group. The main difference between the two were the greater number of soft tissue related complications in the operative group. Um, this paper also did a nice review of the existing literature at that point. This was 2010. Uh, Re-rupture rates were analyzed in existing randomized control trials um, and were separated based on papers that used immobilization uh, and limited weight-bearing protocols versus those that used early mobilization and weight-bearing. Um, so these four plots show that there was no statistically significant difference in re-rupture rates when using functional rehab versus operative repair. So this paper is the most recent randomized control trial uh, and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2022, April. Uh, it is the biggest randomized control trial to date uh, with 526 total patients. It's a multi-center out of Norway where the patients were randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one fashion for non-operative treatment, MIS, and open surgery. Um, they utilized an accelerated functional rehab protocol and only included patients that were placed in a cast within 72 hours of injury in all groups. Um, there was no, <clears throat> excuse me, there was no significant difference in the primary outcome, which was the change in Achilles tendon total rupture score. Uh, notably, though, there was a 6.2% re-rupture rate in the non-op group compared to the 0.6% in the operative group. Uh, no significant differences in any of the other patient reported outcomes. Um, these are just... Uh, Tables showing that there was no significant um, difference in the functional scores and physical tests um, or the functional scores um, at any time point. This is table four um, showing the serious and minor adverse events. As you can see, the MIS surgery had a higher rate of sensory nerve injuries. Um, there was similar deep infection rates across all three groups. Um, the re-rupture rates, as I mentioned, was a little higher in the non-op group at 6.2%. And then there was no superficial infections in the non-op group, uh, one in the MIS group, and three in the open repair group. They did note that half of the re-ruptures in this study recurred within the first 10 weeks from the injury. I don't know. They don't really mention it, or, or I didn't 
C. Dr. Gatt asked, how is there a deep infection in the non -op? Not benign, and uh, at times when applied correctly, some people will put some weight on it, probably from cast source. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, this was a meta analysis. Um, so the next couple studies are kind of meta analysis of the existing injuries. There's JBJS um, out of 2012, um, it was a meta analysis of 10 studies. Um, they looked at re-rupture rates and found that functional rehab, there was no difference. Um, the immobilization group surgery reduced the re-rupture risk by 8.8% um, if they did not use functional rehab. Complications other than re-rupture um, surgery resulted in a roughly 3.9 times greater um, complication rate than non-op. Um, all of these complications were kind of grouped together, though. Um, return to work, surgical patients return to work on average about 19 days sooner. And there was no significant difference in cast circumference, strength, and functional outcomes. Uh, this is a chart showing the re-rupture rate um, for subgroups based on functional rehab versus uh, prolonged immobilization, showing no difference with functional rehab and um, a lower rate with surgery compared to prolonged immobilization. These are all the pooled complications um, showing a lower complication rate uh, favoring the non-operative group. Uh, the complications that they included were deep and superficial infections, skin and tendon necrosis, fistulas, scar adhesion, serial nerve damage, decreased ankle motion, over lengthening of the tendon, DVT, and PE. So they found that one additional complication other than re-rupture could be expected for every seven patients treated surgically. Um, these are tables showing the range of motion favoring uh, the non-operative side and then the strength, which showed no difference. This was another meta-analysis, a little more recent in OJSM in 2015, was a systematic review of nine meta-analyses, a uh, total of 5,842 patients. Um, main takeaways um, were similar to what I've uh, mentioned previously. There were seven studies that showed a higher rate of re-rupture in the non-op group, uh, higher rate of complications in the operative group. There was one study that showed operative treatment decreased re-rupture rate only when compared to non-mobilization uh, with functional rehab. And then there were three studies that showed earlier return to work in the operative group. Um, this was a very heterogeneous uh, group. Uh, there were a lot of different protocols in terms of MIS versus open repair and functional bracing versus mobilization. Here's another meta-analysis and systematic review published in BMGA in 2019. It included 29 studies, 10 randomized controlled trials of about 1,000 patients, and then 19 observational studies that had about 15,000 patients. Um, they showed that re-rupture um, was significantly reduced in the operative group. Um, so there was a statistical significance in this paper, albeit the um, absolute value was low in both groups. Operative rate was about 2.3% and the non-operative group 3.9%. Um, there was no difference between the groups using accelerated functional rehab with early range of motion. Um, and the complication rate was higher in the operative group at 4.9% uh, versus 1.6, and there was a, about a 3% infection rate. These are just um, forest plots showing the re-rupture rate on the left and the complication rate on the right. And then this is a similar chart um, grouping the randomized control trials on top and the observational studies at the bottom. Here's a table from that paper that shows the number and the incidence of the complications in the meta-analyses, um, showing a 2.8% uh, wound and skin infection rate in the operative treatment side. So this is an interesting study of military population published in FAI in 2016. That was a retrospective review at a single military center across three years, um, 57 patients, 27 operative and 30 non-op. Um, interestingly, um, it kind of correlates with the trends of management. Uh, the non-op rates increased significantly over those years. 2011 was 12%, 2012 was 57%, 2013 was 84%. Um, the outcomes, there were no DVTs or wound complications in this cohort. There were no significant differences in re-rupture or other complications, um, although the non-op tended towards a higher value. 
Um, and then the big finding here was that the return to work was about one and a half months sooner in the operative group. Here's table three, just comparing the operative and non-operative groups, showing a significant difference in time to, uh, to return to duty. Uh, these next two papers use the similar cohort or the same cohort, I should say. Um, this patient or this uh, paper was a randomized control trial, also published in AJSM in 2017. Um, there were 60 patients treated within one week, um, and it was open repair versus functional rehab. Primary outcome of this study was the volume of the calf muscles on the MRI at three and 18 months. There was no difference at three months, um, but there was a difference in soleus um, muscle volumes at 18 months. The operative uh, was less than, uh, was about 17% of the contralateral unaffected side, and non-op was about 25% uh, less than the non-op side. Um, they also looked at fatty degeneration of the calf muscles that showed no difference. Um, and importantly, they showed that the length of the Achilles tendon was about 19 millimeters longer in the non-op group. Um, this may be the cause of this last point, um, which was that the isokinetic plantar flexion strength was found to be about 10 to 18 percent greater in the operative group. Um, this was, again, the same cohort, a different paper studied a year prior or published a year prior. Um, that showed no difference in re-rupture rates. Um, however, they did have about 14% re-rupture rate. Um, it was a small cohort. That's why there's no statistical significance. The authors generally explain this away as poor patient compliance, um, but interesting nonetheless that it was such a high re-rupture rate. And then other complications, there was one deep uh, wound infection in the operative group. So this just shows similar Lepilotti scores at 18 month follow-up. This is data showing the isokinetic data. Um, at three months of follow-up, both groups were similar. At six months, um, there was about 16 to 24% difference uh, in strength. And then at 18 months, um, like I mentioned, 10 to 18% um, improvement and strength in the operative group versus the non-operative group. This just shows the uh, RAND 36 health survey scores between the two groups. Um, there was a statistically significant difference in terms of physical functioning as well as bodily pain in the surgical group in favor of the surgical group versus the non-surgical treatment. All right, so that's a lot about operative versus non-operative. So I think some of the takeaways, uh, the non-op management with early functional rehab has been com comparable outcomes to operative managements with seemingly lower complication rates and similar re-rupture rates. Um, now there are some limitations, of course, to these studies. Um, none of these studies were powered to determine the difference in re-rupture rate. Um, given that it is a rare event, uh, you need many patients, um, although the absolute re-rupture rate remains relatively low um, in studies using functional rehab. Um, there's no evidence. Um, so some of the proponents of surgery uh, on these patients will argue that the, the no evidence of difference between the re-rupture rates is not the same as there's evidence of no difference between re-rupture rates, which is um, an important concept um, to understand in, in um, analyzing really any papers. Um, the complication rates are often grouped together. Um, not all complications are equal. Re-rupture is certainly a much more devastating complication than a transient nerve irritation. Wound complications similarly vary between superficial and deep. Um, loss of follow-up data is rarely reported, a large age range and heterogeneous population. Um, and then they largely, these studies largely compare open surgery versus functional rehab, although there are more recent studies that include MIS surgery as well. Um, things that, uh, bent, that are shown to potentially be better in operative management of these injuries are functional strength, um, although it's important to note that neither returns to the contralateral side. Um, and what is the clinical importance in most patients of a little bit stronger plantar flexion remains to be seen. And then return to work has been shown to be slightly faster in the operative cohort. So we'll talk quickly about the percutaneous versus open data that's out there. So MIS is not a new concept, although it's gained a lot of popularity with new devices that have come out. Uh, Mon Griffith in 1977 um, reported 
a percutaneous approach, although it was plagued by higher re-rupture rates due to lack of tenon visualization. Um, there have been many, many modifications and techniques described since. Some of the current popular devices include the Ashelon PARS and the Tino leg, all shown here, um, that involves some sort of percutaneous device that allows to get sutures into the peritoneon and into the Achilles. Um, this was a recent systematic review and meta-analysis in 2021, published in AJSM, it included 10 randomized controlled trials, 522 patients, 260 were treated with open repair, and 262 were treated with MIS. Um, primary outcomes were functional scores, re-ruptures, serial nerve in injuries, infections. Secondary outcomes included skin complications, adhesions, um, ankle range of motion, and surgical time. So some of the main findings um, in the open cohort was a longer, longer surgical time, a higher risk of superficial infections and ankle stiffness. The MIS um, had a higher rate of transient serial nerve palsy that almost all um, got better by um, a, a, up to a year. Uh, and then re-rupture rates and functional outcomes were similar across the two groups. Um, so again, looking a little closer into that data, there was no significant difference between MIS and open surgical repair in AOFAS scores. There was a higher total complication rate in the open group, uh, although it wasn't statistically significant. Um, there was a higher re-rupture rate, also not statistically significant, but higher in the open group. Deep infection, no difference. There were zero deep infections in the MIS cohort. Um, and then skin necrosis dehiscence rate, adhesion rate, and chelate scar, scar showed no difference. Um, where they did have a significant difference, like I mentioned, was a serial nerve injury, about 3% of patients in the MIS cohort, and superficial infection, um, which was 6% in the open group and 0.4% in the MIS group. Surgical time also faster by about um, 20 minutes in the MIS group. So this is just showing some of the um, different repair methods that were included in the studies uh, as part of this meta-analysis. A shows the open techniques and B shows the MIS techniques. This is just a big table showing all the studies um, or including all the studies, um, looking at different outcomes. Um, we mentioned surgical time, the superficial infection rate, um, the functional scores, uh, time to return to sports um, was quicker in the open repair group. Um, and then plantar flexion, uh, degrees of plantar flexion was increased in the MIS group. So we'll talk briefly about Achilles tendon ruptures in elite athletes. Um, these are not your weekend warriors, like my dad and brother. Um, so there was a TROFA study uh, out of AJSM in 2017 that looked at the professional athletes return to play and performance after operative repair of an Achilles tendon rupture. This was a cohort study uh, across the four major sports. Many patients treated surgically between 89 and 2013. Um, so importantly, um, about 30% of athletes that were treated for an Achilles tendon rupture did not return to play. A very devastating injury. Um, the game participation was about 75% at one year, 81% at two years. Um, play time and performance significantly decreased across the board, um, less so in MLB players and more so in NBA players. Um, and fewer games played, decreased play time and worse performance compared to mash controls at one year. However, there was no difference at two years. So it's a long recovery to get back where you were. This just shows some of the demographic data from that uh, study uh, across the NBA, NFL, and MLB. Um, this is comparing the games played pre versus post operatively and player performance. As you can see, there's uh, uh, statistically significant decrease in games played for all comers uh, in the NBA and NFL, but not the MLB, similar um, in terms of player performance. Um, this is another um, table that table and graphs that compare uh, these patients that suffered Achilles tendon rupture to matched controls. So another study in 2011 uh, that was a retrospective case series um, between 96 and 2003. 17 elite athletes, one surgeon, isolated Achilles tendon repair within two weeks of the repair um, or of rupture. Um, there were all athletes that competed at a national level or professionally. There were 14 that had indirect trauma and three had direct trauma. Notably, all of these patients had various bouts of Achilles tendinopathy prior to rupture and had received injections um, and then went on to receive uh, percutaneous surgical repair. They were all fully weight-bearing by the eighth post-off week. Uh, there was a 13% rate of superficial infections, 
uh, the same rate um, of patients too had prolonged pain on weight bearing. Um, and the calf circumference was significantly decreased. The time to return to sports in this cohort was about five months. So these are just the individual um, players um, and lists some of the complications commonly swelling around the tendon or ankle as seen in these patients. This is just a percutaneous approach that was utilized um, with three kind of small transverse incisions um, with suture passing. This is a re review article um, that looked at kind of a bunch of studies on elite athletes and Achilles tendon ruptures. Um, they really just, there's not a lot of data. There's no real non-operative literature. Um, as you might imagine, elite athletes are getting these fixed. Um, the return to sport is about 70% um, and there's diminished performance almost across the board. Uh, functional rehab does seem to be important in elite athletes, just like everyone else. Um, but there's really limited return to play protocols uh, that are heterogeneous across the literature. Um, and they advocate for the use of sport specific milestones for return to play. So the last kind of um, thing we'll talk about here is the management and delayed presentation. Um, so the literature varies uh, on what is defined as a chronic Achilles tendon ruptures. Um, the presentation can be anywhere from more than two weeks to six weeks. I think the most common that I saw in the literature was a chronic injury is considered anything that presents about after six weeks. Um, but what about the delayed presentation? It seems to me just anecdotally that a lot of these patients are presenting two, three, four weeks after their injury. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, and there seems to be limited data on how to manage those patients, whether surgical versus non-op. And a lot of the studies that I mentioned had inclusion criteria that required patients to present within two weeks or sometimes within like 48 hours. Um, so is a delayed presentation indication for surgical management. Um, this was a study I found um, in the UK. Uh, it was a retrospective study. They identified 19 patients that presented in a delayed fashion from two to 12 weeks and had long-term follow-up. Um, in the area of, of interest for me was they had eight patients with a delay in treatment um, of two to six weeks. Notably, three patients did fail in that similar time frame and required uh, Achilles reconstruction with an FHL transfer. There were no re-rupture or skin complications, um, and they used a functional rehab um, a program called the Swansea Morrison Achilles Rupture Treatment Protocol, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, they had functional outcomes were improved. Um, there was a difference in 21% in plantar torque compared to the contralateral side, which is in finding with the non-operative data that I've presented so far. So their conclusions were that non-op can be effective even in delayed presentation, but surgery may still be preferable in patients with a large gap size or a high functional demand. Um, this is, again, just showing the immobilization protocol. Um, they allowed um, full weight bearing in equinus um, right away uh, and then increased range of motion um, later on. So this is a descriptive table. Table 1A is on the top. These are the eight patients that presented in a delayed fashion between two and six weeks. They had good long-term follow-up, um, and some of them had data on gap size. Um, 2A just showing these patients who presented between two and six weeks, showing an improvement generally in the patient reported outcome scores. And then table five is a summary of the three patients who, who quote unquote failed the SMART protocol. Um, the first two um, required FHL transfer, um, one at seven months and the other that after developing tendinopathy and plantar fascia, fascia pain and had poor function. The third one uh, they said was um, non-compliant with the protocol and also required an FHL transfer. This study uh, was out of AJSM in 2020, also looking at, uh, in this time, operative management of that kind of delayed group, 14 to 30 days. Um, it was a cohort study, 21 patients presenting within 14 and 30 days versus um, 21 matched patients who presented acutely. Um, they used MIS. Uh, they found at 12 months, no difference in Achilles tendon rupture scores and Achilles tendon resting ankles. There were no wound infections, but they did find one iatrogenic sural nerve injury in the acute group treated with MI, or yeah, sorry, in the acute group. This is another kind of version of a percutaneous approach, small stab incisions, proximally, medial and lateral, and then one bigger one distally um, using suture shuttle techniques. Um, table one here shows the descriptive data for delayed presentation versus acute control groups, similar 
uh, patient matched controls. Um, there was a significant difference though between the time from injury to diagnosis, which is what they were looking at. Um, table two shows similar functional scores between the two groups. Um, table three shows um, also similar between the two groups, but not um, but lower isometric strength compared to the contralateral leg, which again is in finding with um, what I've reported before. All right, so that was a lot of studies. Um, what have we talked about so far? Where are we now? Um, so certainly operative versus non-operative continues to be a debate. The non-operative rate of treatment of these injuries has increased significantly um, for a lot of the reasons that I've talked about. Um, we've talked about MIS versus open. MIS is certainly increasing as well, um, although the data is lagging behind um, the open surgical treatment. Uh, we talked a little bit about elite athletes, kind of the limitations of data there, but that almost all of them are getting surgical management. Um, we talked a little bit about how delayed presentation may or may not be an indication uh, for surgery um, in that kind of two to four to six week zone. And then the golden question is, what is the optimal treatment? Um, ultimately, this is a patient-specific problem. You have to take into account age, comorbidities, activity level. I think a lot of these patients could be treated non-operatively. Um, it depends on the acuity and also shared decision-making. Um, you can recommend one thing to a patient all you want, but if they're really set on one way to treat themselves, then they'll figure out a way to do it. Um, I just wanted to bring this up. AOS did put out clinical practice guidelines in 2010. Um, a lot of, actually most of the strength of their recommendations are either consensus, inconclusive, or weak. Um, they do have two moderate suggestions. Um, one that they suggest early protective weight bearing with patients who have been treated operatively, and then suggesting the use of protective device that allows mobilization by two to four weeks. So back to the cases. Um, so the first one was the weekend warrior with an acute Achilles tendon rupture. Uh, the second one was a collegiate gymnast. And the third one was the truck driver. Um, my dad and brother actually got theirs fixed um, and are doing fine now. Um, the second one uh, was fixed as well, also doing well. And the third one was uh, fixed using this PARS system. Um, so I've seen it a couple of times. So I just wanted to kind of show you some pictures. These are intraop photos. This jig gets inserted into the peritinon and driven proximally. Um, you use needles to pass suture through the tendon body itself, and then you pull the jig out so that the sutures are in the inside of the peritinon. You can then dock it distally um, with a similar method, or you can use suture anchors into the calc. Um, so that is an option that, that I've seen a couple times. Use a smaller transverse incision compared to the vertical. So in summary, diagnosis of acute Achilles tendon ruptures is clinical, uh, non-operative management with functional rehab appears to have similar outcomes compared to open operative management. Uh, Re-rupture rates also appear to be similar between the non-operative management with functional rehab versus surgical repair. Um, MIS has shown lower rates of wound complications with similar outcomes. Um, surgical management is the mainstay for treatment for elite athletes, although data is limited. And time to presentation does um, clinically play a significant role in management. Wanted to thank Drs. Gatt, Swan, Fleming, Schaefer, and Kirschenbaum for their expertise in this matter. Um, here are my references. I don't take any questions. Um, I have a question, Jeremy. It's Rob Epstein. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, great presentation. Um, just a question. When you go through the whole uh, talk, there's nothing, um, I, I might have missed it, but I don't think there's much about really the uh, we talked about the paratenon, which we can't really image that well, but uh, we didn't talk about how big the gap was a lot or how the tendon looks uh, underneath. And one question is we do get a lot of these people do come for MRIs for the Achilles. And I'm wondering, I used to just think it was the gap. What are they looking for? Because none of your talks really talk about how degenerated the tendon is or how big the gap is or uh, how much atrophy there might be. Uh, uh, so does the image, so what from an imaging study do you, uh, affects your uh, treatment decision, if anything? Yeah, you know, from, from everything I read, you know, a lot of, you know, some people routinely get MRIs on this injury. A, a lot don't. Um, I think MRIs are often utilized in kind of equivocal or chronic cases. There's not a, from what I found, not a ton of data that correlates gap 
versus treatment outcomes. Um, I think there's some gestalt that a lot of surgeons use that if they see a higher gap, they might lean more towards operative management, um, which I think is reasonable, but there are patients that have a really large gap that heal um, with non-operative management. Um, so I, I think there's not a ton that, that really correlates uh, gap versus um, outcomes based on treatment, unless, unless I missed it. Thank Rob, you. I, I rarely get an MRI for an Achilles tendon rupture. I, I mean, I just saw somebody yesterday who come, came in two weeks out. Of course, he was seen by his primary care physician who ordered the MRI. The clinical diagnosis was so obvious. There's no reason to get an MRI. I, I suspect that the majority of the MRIs aren't ordered by orthopedic surgeons. I think maybe one reason to get an MRI, and you probably don't need it in most cases. And in fact, if it's obvious and in the typical location, you don't need it. But if it's a little more proximal, several centimeters more proximal than typical, um, I worry about the ability to capture the tendon with a PARS or an minimally invasive repair. So if uh, when you're palpating the tendon, it just seems a little bit more proximal than typical, sometimes that information can be helpful. Um, but if you're going to do a longitudinal incision for your minimally invasive approach, that's less of an issue. If you're going to do a transverse approach, then, then that's more of an issue because then you're extending, you know, a Z-shaped incision where you're, you have the risk of flat necrosis. So um, not evidence-based, but just some uh, suggestions for my mentors along the way. Uh, I, your uh, talk was excellent. It was a great presentation. The literature is clear and interesting. Every one of your cases underwent surgery, despite the fact the literature truly supports non-operative treatment other than possibly uh, athletes, only because you want to avoid litigation and probably the healing is quicker when you put it end to end and the remodeling is quicker and return to strength is quicker, even though the first year back, there probably isn't a single athlete that's the same as his second year back or her second year back. I would just comment on the MRI, having ruptured my Achilles uh, shortly after starting in my profession after fellowship, uh, at that point, I reviewed everything that was written, and uh, more than 50% of the people that were attendings and residents at the time thought it should be fixed. And obviously, being, being conservative and reading everything there was, uh, I treated it non-operatively. I will tell you that I did get an MRI, immediately put it in a cast. I had a five-centimeter uh, space between the two ends. Didn't matter whether the knee was flexed or extended. The five centimeters stayed the same. And I got an MRI three months, six months, a year, and two years. If you get an MRI at two years, uh, the radiologist will not even know that you have ruptured it. The peritoneum stays intact. It goes through the normal healing, hypertrophy. By about a year, the hypertrophy is gone. And if you measured the strength at two years, most of the studies measure it between one year and two year. The strength at two years, even treating it conservatively, is identical to the other side. So I think one of the issues is we don't have long enough follow-up to show that the strength is truly not different, but it takes a long time to remodel. Um, so I think that's, uh, and I agree with Charlie and everybody else that said for the most part, MRIs are, are not necessary. I only did it to follow it radiographically just to see what it looked like. Jeremy, great job. One additional comment. Um, interestingly, if you read some of the published personal protocols from the surgeons championing these non-op trials, particularly Dr. Glazebrook um, from the 2012 study, the famous head analysis at the Canada. You know, if, if he doesn't have a patient that presents within 48 hours or doesn't see someone else within 48 hours and is placed with, you know, into a plantar flexion device within that time period, he recommends operative treatment. And you know, that's kind of a controversial topic. Um, some people recommend, you know, if they don't. Uh, receive a device where they're in plantar flexion between 48 and 72 hours, then uh, maybe operative treatment it, it, it is, you know, should get more consideration given the re-rupture rate. So um, the other thing is I, I would probably disagree with one of your conclusion statements that the re-rupture rate is equal between early accelerated rehab and operative treatment. I think um, you know, that's the conclusion of the 2010 study with 140 patients, about 70 in each, in each group. Uh, but the meta-analysis since then and the most recent 500-plus um, patient randomized control trial from Norway, I believe that you presented, um, disagrees with that So, uh, by about a factor of 10. So um, I think when you look at the data in totality, there's, there's, that could be debated.
you know, if you put someone in a cast on day one, the space changes nominally. The space between the tendon edge, edges doesn't make a difference. All right, so putting it in 48 hours, no one has data to show that putting a cast on in 48 hours or a week or two weeks makes a difference. In fact, this data, even as late as a month. The same is true if, if you treat a mallet finger, you could treat them three months later and they heal. Understanding the pathobiology of tendon healing with a paratenon is critical to understanding this, this problem. Um, and I also think that the re-rupture rate depends upon the protocol that you use postoperatively. That is not, I think, I know, because that's what the data shows. So how you how you treat someone postoperatively will determine the re-rupture rate. The other thing is if you look at one they re-rupture, if you treat it closed and you tell them to go back to basketball and soccer at six months or nine months, which is their, what they're doing with open repairs, you're going to have a higher re-rupture rate. If you wait more than a year, a year and a half, the re-rupture rate is close to zero. And I think the data pans that out. So you need to look and see when they're re-rupturing and what the protocol is. And that's going to be the basis for closed management. Jeremy, I had a quick question on age. So for operative versus non-operative treatment, are there any studies or anything that kind of stratify based on patient age? In other words, a 16-year-old healthy high school student versus a 65-year-old. Um, and everything kind of boils down to re-rupture rate and then operative complications. I would venture to guess that a healthy 16-year-old's uh, complication rate is probably lower than the 66 year old's complication rate and that their risk of rupture, if they're going to be active initially in the first year, two years, or even just their lifetime risk of re-rupture is going to be different as well. So how do we factor in age when we start talking to patients about these studies? Yeah, I agree. You know, that's a, a huge consideration and it goes into kind of your patient specific treatment for these injuries. Most of the large cohorts are all comers. So um, 18 up to, you know, 60. Um, there are probably some um, studies that, that risk stratify them, but um, I, I didn't come across any that were really convincing, but that's certainly a consideration. Um, you know, if you're considering a 55-year-old diabetic smoker, whether you want to operate on, on that person, probably not. Um, I'm sure that they would have a higher rate of complication um, than a young, healthy, active 16-year-old who just ruptured their Achilles tendon. Um, and I think that's part of um, part of the knock maybe on the, the data that's out there is that it is a pretty heterogeneous population. For those of you who treat these frequently, do you have a lot of patients coming in saying, well, all my favorite professional athletes had theirs fixed, why shouldn't I? No. Uh, not, not really. I don't think they talk about the athletes, but it, uh, in fracture conference, we've sometimes said you can talk a patient into anything. And I would disagree regarding Achilles ruptures. Patients, sometimes they just, it's in their head that has to be fixed. And you can't, I can't talk all of them out of it. Uh, so we fix them sometimes, um, which isn't wrong. Uh, it may be right, but, uh, but no, they, uh, they do, they are set in their ways with this one often. The other ones are quite surprised that that's even an option to not fix it. I concur. That's a, that's a very important uh, statement by Dr. Swan. I have over 100 I treated closed. I have two that I operated on. Both people said to me, if you don't fix it, I'm going somewhere else. And so I fixed it. I mean, there is a risk of complication from the wound and other, other types of complications. But that's that's a major problem. Everybody comes in saying that, I was told it had to be fixed. And so if, you, if you're honest about the literature, 95 to 100% of them will go along with what you suggest, but there'll be that small subgroup and it doesn't pay to fight with them. You might as well just fix it. And as I always say, it takes more time to talk someone out of surgery than to talk them into surgery. It's a general uh, feeling with a lot of injuries that we see. Jeremy, I had a question about, I, over the years, there's always been a lot of talk about isokinetic testing. And does has there been any correlation between isokinetic results and functional performance? Because I've never seen that. I have not seen any data that correlates a loss of like plantar flexion measured isokinetically with functional outcomes. 
So Dr. Schaefer, if you're still on, why do you, why do you guys in foot and ankle always do isokinetic testing? Yeah, it's objective. Um, the therapists know how to do it. Uh, it's it's not a perfect metric. And interestingly, in that in that study that you showed, Jeremy, with the soleus atrophy, yep. it showed compensatory FHL hypertrophy. So yep. um, it's it's not a perfect measure of the structure that's injured, right? There are other structures that do similar things that can help. So I don't think there's a good reason the isoconnect testing is is done other than it's convenient and uh, the therapist and I had to do it. Because we've kind of gotten away from it in ACL surgery. In the early days of ACL surgery, everything was isokinetic testing. Finally stopped it because it caused telephemoral pain anyway. And then one other interesting point I added, which I didn't realize, is that you know the majority, the almost every patient that I see in the office who's just a weekend warrior is completely asymptomatic before Achilles tendon ruptures. So when somebody comes in, like getting ready for the New York City Marathon, which happens inevitably every fall, people develop Achilles tendonitis. Their big concern is, oh, I'm going to rupture my Achilles. And I tell them, well, if you have tendonitis, you won't rupture it because people with symptoms never rupture their Achilles. And yet your study on the elite athletes, all of the athletes had prodromal symptoms. Was there any, any discussion about that in that article? Why? Because I think the consensus is that the average person is asymptomatic prior to rupture. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm not sure if that's just the, the cohort. Um, they certainly, all of them had injections, which is probably the cause. Um, so that's that's the only thing I would, would consider that the injections were probably the cause of. Charlie, when do you send athletes that you repair back to sport versus cast treatment? And what uh, physical exam is most important to let you know they're ready to go back? I mean, I, I'm guessing that on average, uh, you know, the, the surgical repairs start working their way back into sports at around six months, give or take. Um, I mean, the, the physical exam characters are just, you know, basic strength. And how they how they're moving through rehab. It's you start to start them on resistance exercises and then some functional work. And there are a lot of you know with the athletic trainers at the school, they can probably you know they're they're carefully watched and you can monitor how they're doing. And it's a kind of a judgment call on how they're how they're rehabbing. Whereas the non-operative people, I would probably say, runs around nine months. But again, they're not they're not collegiate athletes. You ever treated a collegiate athlete closed? No. As it, that's like I've said this again with other things, but you know, with all this data that you have out there, right? It would be interesting to see if somebody took the plunge and and treated a high uh, collegiate athlete non operatively, and then they went back and played and you know scored a touchdown or or slam dunked the ball. That might be all over. Or we're never going to see that because. You know, the concern is that if they re-rupture or if they don't return to their prior level of performance, which, as you pointed out, takes two seasons. I mean, that's the one thing we tell the kids is that, look, you know, your first season back, you'll do OK, but it's probably going to take two years before you're back to where you think you should be. And for pro athletes, they can't accept that. So. I think something else Charlie, is I interesting now that we're getting all these randomized control trials. Um, which unfortunately have an age range from 18 to 65, 70 years old, is if we could focus that analysis on younger patients, come up with some sort of arbitrary age cutoff just to see if that functional difference is uh, really the same because the demands of yeah. a 70 year old are not the same as, you know, a 25 year old or 30 year old, you know, is, is much more. Yeah. Active. A loss of 20% of plantar flexion strength might be more clinically relevant. Well, would be more clinically relevant in a younger patient, perhaps. I would fear a, a higher re-rupture rate there as as well. Like yeah. it's rare to see the I don't see many teens or early twenties with with Achilles, but the the gymnasts that I see, like having them go back to their sport, uh, whatever time frame before a year, uh, I'd be concerned with non-op. Although I don't have a lot of any data for that, but uh, but like Charlie said, it 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 takes it takes some courage and bravery to do these studies, even the non-operative treatment. Just to give a little history to the to the to the young people in the crowd, when I was a resident, it was op versus non-op. That hasn't changed, but the non-operative treatment was quite different. It was a mobilization, as Jeremy said, for 
six weeks minimum, maybe more, 10 or 12 weeks. And some people even treated it with a long leg cast for those first six weeks. That's totally different. And now we know, and we should have known, that that's part of the reason why there was a higher re-rupture rate because it didn't heal as well as it will if you start early range of motion and early weight bearing. But it took bravery and, and a good study in, in the early 2000s to, to convince us that we could that it was safe to do that. So who's going to be the brave person to, to treat a, a young person non-operatively? Go get him, Dr. Swan. <laughs> no, you, know, it's good, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a primary care sports physician who injects amnion into everything. <laughs> and that'll be the reason. Because that that's the that's that is the latest trend in uh, in high level sports medicine, like all the MCL injuries, all the ankle sprains. And this is going on across the country are being treated with uh, early PRP or amnion injections and some early immobilization. And they're all touting how well the patients return to sports but i suspect that might be the one the one group that might give it a whirl and say they can enhance the healing with some of the biologics jeremy i was going to mention the quality of the functional rehab we keep talking about it like it's one thing and that it right. is done the same way across the entire country right. uh, but but it's not and um it's great when you're in a practice where you have your own pt um, and you can control as the surgeon what the physical therapists are doing. But there are a lot of practices out there where they don't and they get sent out to quote unquote PT um, and they basically pick their PT based on their insurance. Uh, and they may pick a not, you know, a mom and pop shop up the street that their insurance approved. And it was the only one that the insurance approved. And their their non-operative care is not going to be the same as somebody who goes to a you know sports medicine physical therapist who is trained on this rehab. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's seem, also seems to be a wide variety also of protocols, um, most of them similar enough. But yeah, I, I think non-compliance or um, having a, a maybe subpar therapist would play a huge role in, in potential re-rupture rates and complications. I, I, would, I would say yes and no, in, in part just to understand the protocol, at least the one that I follow related to Willett's protocol, is is the early early range of motion at two weeks is directed by the patient there's no physical therapist there it's just very simple at active dorsiflexion passive plantar flexion to neutral it's nothing but it's just a little bit of motion that they didn't use to get when they're in a cast and uh and and that's all they have to do five minutes an hour is how it's how it's written um so that part i think is it seems that the data shows that's a very important component of it. Yeah, the early range of motion, certainly. Um, it's hard to tease out whether the early weight bearing or the early range of motion has more of an effect. Um, but, you know, whether it's, whether it's compliance through physical therapy or patient compliance would, you know, would certainly have an impact. Jeremy, one, one, uh, area of study that we still don't know as you mentioned was the delayed presentation yeah. and it uh it seems that seems that we get some of these in the clinic and if a young person in the audience is looking for a study perhaps we could gather that data these people that show up three weeks later and i know we've treated them non-operatively and and anecdotally from some of the residents they do just fine uh could we capture that yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I think it might be a little bit of a struggle getting the numbers, um, but it's certainly a good population to test them out in because they, they on average, show up much later than, than patients that see you in the office. Two from last week. Yeah, Joe Mar saying he had two last week that were delayed. Joe Mar said one was four weeks and the other three weeks, so. And we'll and you're treating them not not up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you can follow them, just just need follow them for a year. Yeah, it's a good idea. All right, thank you, everybody. Great job. Nice job. Thanks.